Good morning, church. We're so glad you've joined us today. It is now a time to worship.
and welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church of Azo. We're so glad that you're joining us today, whether that's through Facebook or YouTube. We're glad to have you here and as part of our church family today. Want to encourage you to please share a comment that you are here. Just tell us that you're you're watching. Uh, you can even let us know how many are watching. And we also want to invite you if you have a prayer request. You can do that in a comment if you'd like to keep it private. You can send it to church at fumcazel.org or contact me and we'll add it to our prayer list. We will lift up what's on your heart in prayer each week and invite you to do so today. Also want to encourage you to just keep in contact with one another during this time. We are seeing some progress in the flattening of the disease curve and hopefully the time that we can gather together in person for worship will not be too far off. But in the meantime, take a few moments, call your neighbors, call your friends, call those in your classes, small groups, and just check in on folks, check with each other, make sure everybody's all right. And just remember that we are always, although separated in distance, one in Jesus Christ. So glad that you're here as we gather and worship today. As we prepare for our morning time of prayer, let us sing this wonderful promise together. He is Lord. Let us in one voice and one spirit 
Pray as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And why do you 
Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. story told of a teacher who was asking her fourth grade class to name a person whom they consider the greatest human being alive in the world today. And every kid in the class had a different answer. There was the, the kid who, who liked sports and he thought Tiger Woods was the greatest golfer of all time. And there was a little girl in the class and she thought the Pope was the most wonderful living person because he cared for people and he didn't even get paid for it. And there was another little boy who said, I think the greatest living person is my mom because she takes care of me and my brother. And this kind of, the answers just went on and on and on and kind of what you would expect. So she got to a little boy named Billy. And she asked Billy that question without hesitating. Billy said, I think the greatest person is Jesus Christ. And the teacher said, well, Billy, I, I think that is wonderful. He does always want to help everybody and, and look after everyone. And I like your, your answer because I'm a Christian also. But I, I asked you to speak about somebody who was living. Do you have someone else you want to talk about? And Billy said, oh, no, Miss Thompson, that's not right. Jesus is alive today. He lives in me right now. Haven't you ever heard of Easter? That little boy understood the importance of Easter. We're on the other side now. It's a different, different spot from where we were last week. And one of the things we say as a people of faith is that the greatest affirmation that we have as the Christian people is not that Jesus was born. It's not that he preached. It's not the miracles that he performed. It's not even that he embodied the very presence of God. The most important affirmation we share is that Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive within us and in our world. That's the message we're called to share. That's part of what we read in this gospel passage. We are called to share and to live that Easter good news. Now we just spent six weeks getting to Easter. And that season of Lent as we thought about how do we stop and pause in our lives and, and draw closer to Christ. We've finished that six weeks journey to Easter and on this Sunday after Easter, it's kind of the what's next sort of time. I mean, for the disciples, we remember that, that you know, they had questions about, about what was going on. They had questions about this Jesus who had died. And, and here, as we find in this passage, is now in their presence. What do we do with post-Jesus? How do we understand light and life? Because of the Christ who lives. How do we understand ourselves? How's life been changed? How's faith been changed? Those are questions that just simply remind us you can't keep Jesus dead. Jesus lives. And keeping people dead, keeping Jesus dead, is what his opponents wanted. Keeping Jesus dead is what those who think Christianity is for the weak-minded or simple-hearted would like to say. 
keeping Jesus dead is for everyone who thinks Jesus was a, a gifted and talented person, but without divinity. But the fact of the matter is, you can't keep Jesus dead. No one can keep Jesus dead. And the Gospels are very clear on that point. Jesus appears to his disciples. He shares this greeting of peace, offers his hands, his feet, his side as evidence that it's really him. And this was a turning point in the resurrection. This is a turning point in the, in the lives of the disciple as the living Jesus helps them focus on what's next. You know, one of the things we have to do is we have to decide what happens with our faith because Jesus lives. We have to decide about our faith. Where are we going? What, what does this mean for us? And to contemplate, you know, that Jesus was alive, we have to put ourselves in the shoes of the disciples. They had millennia of human history that tells you when you're dead, you're dead. That has been undisputed for millennium before their lives. When you're dead, you're dead. The dead people, when they're dead, stay dead. But here's Jesus, whom they watched crucified. A couple of the disciples, the women, sharing that, laid in the tomb. No question, he was dead. And so when Jesus appears to them, of course they're, they're surprised. And they're trying to figure out what's going on. And I love the way that, that the gospel shares with us that emotional state that they're in when they see this living Jesus. And they wonder, first of all, is this a ghost? Or is this something else? Is this really him? Because it says, while well, in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. Ghosts don't eat. Spirits don't eat. People eat. Jesus reveals this is really him. And you know, in, in this moment, for the disciples, their world is still reeling over the crucifixion. For us, Easter was a week ago. We've put the decorations up. We've eaten all the chocolate bunnies that existed in the house. We've moved on to other things and other thoughts and our calendars just going along. All the Easter eggs were made into deviled eggs or egg salad. But for the disciples, they're still grieving. They're still feeling hopeless. They're still trying to figure this out. Their world had been crushed. Their dreams had been turned to ash. And we can understand that, I think, because anyone who's lived very long has understood that emotional state. You ever, can you remember feeling that way at a moment in your life where everything just seemed to go horribly wrong? Can you think of a moment when you spent a lot of time and energy and emotional commitment to something you believed in with all your heart and then watched it disintegrate? We understand this mindset of the disciples as Jesus entered. It's no wonder it was amazing to them. It would be amazing to us. But the Jesus after the resurrection was the same Jesus as before the crucifixion. And Jesus calms their fears simply by letting them see it's really him and shows them his hands to see the scars and his feet and his side. I mean, the disciples knew what happened to Jesus. They witnessed it. They knew that he was dead. But now these same scars, these same wounds became proof that's really him. Jesus was the living proof. It's also important for us to remember that the witnesses of the crucifixion were not people who were easily convinced. The disciples were not easily convinced. They were very realistic, practical, down-to-earth people. You weren't going to fool them. You weren't going to, to put something over on them. And so they did what I think any of us would do. They had some doubts at first. Is this really Jesus? What else did you do? When you're faced with something so impossible, what can you do? But we also have to remember that having doubt is not a bad thing and it's not sinful and it's not necessarily evil. Because if you open yourself to the possibility of faith, 
you also open yourself to the possibility of doubt. If you open yourself to the possibility of faith, you also open yourself to the possibility of doubt. But, you know, we really don't do doubt very well. At least on the outside. We, we try not to show that we're ever doubtful. We want to show that we're in charge and we're secure and we're confident even if we have doubts. But we do doubt. If we're honest with ourselves, we doubt all kinds of things. We doubt people's motives. We doubt people's words. We doubt how trustworthy some people might be. We doubt a large segment of things that happen all the time. And we question, are those things really going to happen the way that someone says? And the reason we doubt is because we've gotten burned in the past. And if you've ever gotten burned, if your trust has been betrayed, then you're going to have some skepticism. You're going to have some doubt when you hear somebody say or promise something you're not sure they can deliver. But you know, that's one of the things I appreciate most about the disciples in the post-resurrection appearances. They doubt it. And we usually lay that all on Thomas. But let's be honest, they all doubt it. They all questioned. They all had to see and know if it was really Jesus. And that's one of the things I appreciate about the simplicity of the resurrection stories in the gospel. Jesus appears to them. He reveals the kingdom of God and that there is new life in his name. Same message we live and that we share. And I think one of the questions this passage asks us is what do you doubt? What do you doubt about God? What do you doubt about faith? Where are your doubts as you think about living in the kingdom of God? Or, or what do you doubt or believe in your soul about trusting God? What do you do when you believe but that belief is challenged? Sometimes it leaves us not quite knowing what to do. Like the story of a man from England, his name is Michael O'Neill, lived in Middlesbrough, England, or Middlesbrough, England. And on June 2nd of 2008, he decided to take a trip to Australia to visit a friend of his. And there was nothing wrong in that. He just didn't tell anybody he was going to Australia to go visit this friend. And after several days, his neighbors who usually saw him and spoke with him got nervous because they didn't see him out and about. So they called the police. Police came in, broke down his door, went into his house. Nobody there, nothing disturbed, not sure what had happened, and, and people just didn't know. Well, then a couple of weeks later in the newspaper, there was an obituary for a Michael O'Neill in St. Middlesbrough, England. But it was not the Michael who was in Australia. It was a different Michael. And it listed his brothers as Kevin and Terry. And in the most bizarre of coincidences, Michael in Australia had two brothers named Kevin and Terry. And everybody thought he had gone missing, he was dead, they were, gonna, they were planning a service for him when one of his friends got a postcard from Michael in Australia wishing him well and saying when he was coming back. And when he got back to England, he got back to his house, the police were there guarding his house, and, and his neighbors, he said, literally thought he was a walking ghost. They did not really believe he was alive. And when he was being interviewed later by the newspaper, he said, this is the weirdest thing ever. This weirdest thing. He said, everywhere I go, people are grabbing me and touching me and saying, I thought you were dead. And he said, I'm getting to where I don't want to go out in public because people are, are, are hanging on to me. It's making me a nervous wreck. And I think that would be a natural relax." reaction if you believe that somebody was actually dead. How the reaction of the disciples must have been similar when Jesus appeared to them. He returned from a different down under and was there in their midst. And I'm sure they wanted to grab on and they, were, they felt better when they saw Jesus eat fish and talk to them and share what does this mean. There are many, many things in life that amaze us and many things that we believe and some things that we doubt. 
Because when we see things that are just seemingly impossible, we want an explanation. The explanation in this passage is the resurrection is a reality. And the impossible positively happened. And the disciples witnessed it. And it was witnessed first to them and then to many others in the coming days. You see, you can't keep Jesus dead. You can't keep him dead in the world. You can't keep him dead in your life. The living Christ gives us the life we seek and the life that we need. And some of the very best news we share after the resurrection is that Jesus is alive. That's what we're called to share. That's part of the meaning of this passage. Just as Jesus is not contained in a tomb, he is not contained in the world, and he is not contained in our lives. And that's good news for everybody. Jesus didn't command us after the command the disciples or us after the resurrection to, to go to church. He said, go out and be the church. Go out in the world, live and share. And that's why even though we can't meet together in this building at the same time, we can still be the church. We still feed the hungry. We still do mission. We still reach out. We can have many ways we share the faith. Disciples shared the good news because they knew they had life in this living Lord who stood in their midst. We are meant to share that good news. We're meant to live it. Not hide it, not hold it, but share it. There's a man whose name I'll probably mispronounce, and so I apologize to anyone who knows Italian better than I do. But his last his first name was Luigi Torizio, if I said it anywhere near correct. And he was found dead in his home one day some years ago. And when the police came in and, and they were checking on him and finding him there, they discovered his house inside was very, very plain and, and very, very empty. It was very, very modest by even the, the standards of the community where he lived. He just didn't have any creature comforts in his house whatsoever. But what he did have in his house was 246 rare violins. 246 rare violins. And they were everywhere, every room, even up in the attic. And the most priceless of those were found in the bottom drawer of his dresser. And one of them in the bottom drawer was a Stradivarius that had not been seen or played for almost 150 years. problem was Teresio kept all that to himself. He inquired, he hid, how, why, nobody really knows. But it was obviously his passion and he worked hard to do it. Jesus doesn't want us to be like Teresio. Good news not to be cherished and locked away and hidden in our hearts. The good news of Jesus Christ who lives within us and we live in him is to be lived and shared and proclaimed. It's a message that tells us the resurrection is a story we hear, we experience, it's in our hands, and we live it and share it in the community around us. I dare you, try and keep Jesus dead. If you believe in the living Christ, you cannot keep him dead in your life or in your actions or in your eyes or in your words or in your hands or in your feet or in anything that you do. If you believe in the living Lord, it's got to be seen in your life. And we live it and we share it. Jesus mapped out for his disciples how the kingdom of God was to be lived. And we see Jesus leading them to this precise point in history. Just as God planned and led for the right time for the Christ to be born. And Jesus shares, just like he did with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, what all of it means. It's about hope, it's about life, it's about salvation. It's about discovering new life in Christ's name. And Jesus' death <coughs> was the essential part of that story. But it's not the last part. Because he lives. And because he lives, it then changes our lives. 
Jesus took a trip to the very depths of pain. And he returned in an amazing triumph. You can't keep Jesus dead. And for anyone who tries, they're going to fail. Jesus lives. He lives in us. And he offers us that same gift. And I ask you as we begin this new week, open your hearts. Open your hearts to the living Christ. Open your mind. Open your soul to all that it means for Jesus to be in your midst and to live and to share in the fullness of new life. Let us pray. Well, gracious Lord, how we thank you for new life in your name. How we thank you for the blessings of this day. How we thank you for the joy and wonder of being your people. Help us as we walk into this new week to do so as a people of living faith. For in your holy name we pray. Amen. Let's continue our worship as we sing and join our hearts together. Let us sing together. Alleluia, alleluia, give thanks to the risen Lord.